lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I'm here with Liberty Larry. How's it going? Doing all right. Yeah. Speaking a little better today. <laughs> we, we were going to record on Wednesday. It's Friday now. Yeah. Um, we were going to record on Wednesday. We went out. No, we were going to we record, record on yesterday. Well, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, that's right. We yeah, were going to record It would have been yesterday. yesterday, yeah, but the yeah. game wasn't canceled. That's right. Yeah. Um, but we got out Wednesday night, uh, and they had some live entertainment at the restaurant and we had to like yell at each other at the table. Like, yeah. I couldn't, um, I'll say the band was pretty good. I mean, they weren't, they yeah. weren't horrible. They no, weren't they bad were, to listen to, they were but fine. I'm not a big fan of live music, but <laughs> so, well, I'm not especially of, when we're like yeah. having dinner and chatting. Exactly. I'm, I'm not a fan of, uh, of going to a restaurant and not being able to talk to the people at my own table. Exactly. Um, <laughs> it's yeah, I didn't. I, we didn't go to a concert. We went to dinner, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. oh. But oh well, um, yeah. you know. Yeah, like you said, it wasn't terrible. It was just yeah, the music was fine. It just it wasn't the time or place for it for us. <laughs> but I, I woke up uh, Thursday morning with a frog in my throat. I was definitely <laughs> yeah. like, uh. at least they at least they don't. You can't smoke in there anymore. Yeah, yeah. That's Could have been worse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Well, there was a time I would have been doing the smoking in there. Well, yeah, me too, but <laughs> oh. move past that. Yeah. Okay. You think about it, I mean, it wasn't that long ago either. Decade? A little over a decade? Yeah. 15 years maybe? Yeah. You're smoking in in places everywhere. That's that's, true. Oh, that's, I was trying to think how long gone. it's been since I quit smoking. Oh, no, um, no. I'm talking about like before like smoking. I mean, when smoking within a restaurant was plenty appropriate and yeah. not nothing... Smoking section and non-smoking section. Yeah. I mean, I quit <laughs> smoking about ventilation. 10 years ago, though. Yeah. And it was probably about five years or so ago when everywhere started adding patios because the county and the state started mm-hmm. mandating whether you could smoke inside an establishment or not. Yeah. You know, th- okay, so this is totally unrelated to anything, but some of the movement started um, when I was in school yeah. uh, in Atlanta. And so I actually did a research paper on the impacts of the... Um, the smoking bans on uh, restaurant business. Yeah, and uh, and I actually I got I got some really interesting results. Like there were some places where you expected that they would probably do do better because of it. Yeah, but um, I remember the one that was kind of counterintuitive to me is that I, I talked to a, a, a Waffle House franchisee yeah. had I don't remember six or eight Waffle House stores up uh, on the north side of Atlanta and. Um, and I expected Waffle House to be one of those places that didn't do as well yeah, without that, having You would think that would hurt and, their business model. Yeah. yeah. Um, but he was like, no, we do a lot more business because we turn tables over so much faster. <laughs> he was like, I wow. don't have people sitting in here drinking uh, a pot of coffee and sitting there for three hours smoking cigarettes and drinking coffee anymore. Yeah. He's like, we turn tables over faster and we do more business. <laughs> That's interesting. I would not have thought about that. Yeah. That would not have occurred to me. Yeah. <laughs> I was surprised too. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's things yeah. you learn by interview. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, so may as well just jump right into the the big news, uh, which is the the stuff going on in Israel. Yeah. Um, I guess this is going to be another one of those episodes where we're on the third rail. <laughs> yeah, we probably go ride it ride it pretty hard. <laughs> so I'll I'll just from as we start this conversation, mm-hmm. I may ask a lot of questions as we go along. I may not. We'll see. Mm-hmm. But but this is not a subject that I'm well versed on. I'll yeah. just let the listeners kind of know in advance. Like I may be doing a lot of listening here because I, this isn't something mm-hmm. that I I did watch a bunch of the news yesterday, so I'm up to date somewhat on what's going on over there. Okay. So least, how is the news presenting it? Let's start there. Um well, I mean, they were I mean, there's my understanding is is there's definite like serious riots in Israel right now. And mm-hmm. it's it's Israelis versus um uh, I Palestinians. Guess Palestinians, yeah, mm-hmm. um, and so it, it's it's basically neighbor against neighbor. You know, I mean, it's it's what I would consider a civil war, basically. Yeah. I mean, and it's it's extremely violent. There's been a lot of lot of people injured and killed so far, mm-hmm. um, and that's within Israel. Um, and then, I, my I thought I had heard yesterday that that the Israelis were sending ground troops into into Gaza, which I don't know exactly what that would look like or how that plays out. But I mean, it's it's very pro-Israel coverage. I would say that. Yeah. Um, I mean, the way I've seen it before, and I, I didn't 
get a chance to look at it much today was that um, that the Palestinians were sending rockets over the border walls. Yeah, yeah. A lot of talk um, about that. Well, and that's, so the Israelis had launched airstrikes yeah. into the Palestinian territories in retaliation. Yeah, which I, I will say, I feel like there was fair coverage of that because they they worded it just like that. Like, so it's like a few rockets came over a wall, mm -hmm. and so we like carpet bombed <laughs> yeah. the Gaza Strip. Which before we we turn on before we started recording, I was asking a lot of questions about Gaza because I'm not like I said, I'm just not that versed in this. And and Gaza is interesting to me. The whole idea that these people are just kind of held captive in this small little strip of land mm -hmm. is crazy. Yeah. Um, I mean, we'll we'll get into the kind of the way the Palestinians are treated in Israel. Yeah. Um, but let's just start with the with where this actually started. I mean, at least this current yeah. um, event actually started. So it started with uh, there's a a neighborhood, a Palestinian neighborhood in East Jerusalem called Sheikh Jarrah okay. um, that uh, the Israeli courts had determined, and this I, I don't. I don't think we have time to really get into the court process, but it is completely unfair. Is we'll it just so we're talking kangaroo court here? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, the Israeli courts had decided um, that the uh, that the Jewish um, peoples had claim to these properties uh, where the Palestinians, and this kind of thing goes on constantly, constantly mm -hmm. in Israel. So um, what happened was a bunch of uh, a bunch of Jewish Jewish Israelis went into the neighborhood and started kicking the people that were living there out of their homes, huh. and it, like evicting them and taking their homes. Wow. Okay. So yeah. that's where this started. Yeah. Um, this particular event, and like I said, this is something that goes on all the time. Yeah. Constantly hmm. um, in in Israel, but in this particular case. Um, the, there started to be protests and, um, and as I understand it, uh, the, then the rockets started. Yeah. Um, now initially the, okay, so let, let's also explain these rockets. All right. Yeah. These rockets are essentially homemade rockets. They're not, yeah. it's not like. I mean, it's Are we not talking like, like a, Diet Coke and Mentos, or no, no, no. I mean, it's more than that. Like, it's, it's surprisingly advanced considering the limited materials they have to work with. Yeah. Um. But uh, but it's not like when you see an Apache helicopter firing a bunch of rockets. It's not yeah. that. Yeah. I mean, okay. it's more. Yeah. It's more like they're lobbing RPGs over the wall. I got gotcha. you. Um, it, it's about that size, and yeah. and it's to the point that um, years ago Israel stopped sounding alerts for rocket attacks yeah. because the the alerts for rocket attacks um, caused panics that caused more injuries than the rockets than themselves. Than the rocket itself. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Um, so they, they just stopped uh, doing the the um, alerts about them. But yeah. anyway, so the Palestinians... Are, are any of these intercepted, by the way? I thought I saw something about they had some kind of system they used to intercept them. Yeah, um, they do intercept some of the rockets. I'm not... I, I'm not know the entirely. Yeah. I mean, so here's the, here's another bit of a background portion. Um, Israel presents this that they are under attack from the Palestinians all the time. Yeah. Now, what you should bear in mind is that the Palestinians are are um, living in occupied territories, like like militarily occupied territories of Israel. Um, and that Israel has, I believe, the fourth largest army in the world and what is arguably the most advanced technologically. Yeah. Uh, so the, <laughs> the yeah. Palestinians that are, you know, tossing RPGs over the wall and throwing rocks yeah. are not really a match for the Israeli military. So the idea that the, Israeli, that the Israelis are under attack and under constant threat from these people yeah. is... A bit overblown. It's Over, exaggerated. Overstated, we'll yeah. yeah. Um, so, but uh, they were evicting people from their homes in Sheikh Jarrah. Uh, it um, resulted in protests, and then um, some of the more radical Palestinian organizations launching rockets. The the violent, uh, what the violent we would call wing, domestic yeah. violent extremists <laughs> over here. Yeah. Um, actually, what what should be called domestic violent extremists, I guess. Yeah. Um, but. Anyway, they uh, so they launched these rockets, um, and it 
the at least the ni- initial barrage that Israel responded to um, lightly injured one Israeli. Yeah. Okay, that was yeah, the sum total of the, the damage. Yeah, it's, that but, was it. Yeah. Um, and then um, Israeli airstrikes that they launched uh, airstrikes into the Gaza region, uh, and their initial airstrikes killed twenty, including ten children. Oh wow! Um, now to date, I think, uh, and I don't have maybe the most up to date numbers, but um, to date, I think uh, the Israeli airstrikes in Gaza have killed one hundred and thirteen, including thirteen children. Wow! Um, and the rocket attacks uh, coming out of Gaza have uh, killed seven, um, including one child. Yeah. Uh, in Israel. So it, this yeah. is really lopsided. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's not it's not what you would consider a fair fight here. Yeah, not at all. And um, so the question becomes like, you know, what what causes all this? And and you got to go way way back. Now I had put together a whole bunch of notes on the um, Israel Palestine uh, conflict uh, a couple of years ago, and then COVID happened, and it yeah. became far more important, and we never <laughs> had a chance to, notes. to yeah. talk about it. Yeah. Um, so. You know, most of my notes were about things that Trump was doing yeah. um, to to prop up the Israelis. Um, but the and mostly this had to do with a bunch of laws that or legislation that was being passed um, to limit any kind of protest against the Israeli state. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> and they were trying to use the Holocaust Remembrance Alliance's definition. Um, of what was anti-Semitism to do this. But the Holocaust Remembrance Alliance's definition, a whole lot of it is about any kind of criticism of the Israeli state. Like, oh. So the Israeli government, criticizing the Israeli government is anti-Semitic. So they're trying to use this kind of racism ploy. It's like this bait and switch kind of thing yeah. where they're trying to call it racism in order to prevent you from criticizing the government of Israel. Gotcha. All right. Yeah. So I guess I need to make this caveat right from the beginning. Yeah. I don't have any problem with Jewish people. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have any problem with the citizens of Israel. Yeah. I have a problem with the Israeli government. The government. In the same way that I have a problem <laughs> with the United States government. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. I can I can def- definitely sympathize with that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so my complaints are really about how the government is handling this stuff, but yeah. it it goes back m- much farther, um, and. So the establishment of the Israeli state, so even before the establishment of the Israeli state, the, um, the colonial powers of Europe had gone into the Middle East and kind of carved it up yeah. um, into little steady states and their own, uh, or, you know, um, colonial states and, um, and kind of divvied it up and they divided it in a way. And we're still left with the legacy of this now, which is why there's a lot of conflict in the Middle East, um, is that they, they cut up these nations in such a way to group, um, various groups that were at odds with each other. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it, it, you know, it's the same kind of thing like we were talking about last week. I think it was last week. Um, we talk about all the time anyway, uh, where the idea was, um, if we keep them, uh, arguing amongst themselves, they won't look it uh, up at us, the colonial power that's that's ruling that's over all of us. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All right. So um, then, at the end of World War II, um, they uh, they carved out um, a section of of Palestine, uh, which was controlled by the um, Great Britain at the time. Yeah. Um, and gave it to the the European Jews after the Holocaust. Yeah. All right. Or what was left. Yeah. Um, so th- the first question is, like, and this was done under uh, the brand new UN, by, by the way. <laughs> yeah. um, the, the question is, uh, does a whole bunch of European powers have the right to give away land in the Middle East? Yeah. Um, Especially when that means literally <clears throat> ripping people out of their their homes and whatnot. And well, it wasn't really intended to be that way in, yeah. in the first place. Um, so initially, the the Palestinians were happy to live with the Jewish peoples moving in there. Yeah. Um, the the Arabs were happy to live with the Jewish peoples moving in there. Yeah. Um, they gave uh, they carved out roughly a little over half. It was like fifty five percent of the existing Palestinian state to give 
to to become Israel, yeah. to become the nation of Israel. Um, now, the, then you had the Zionist um, pair of militaries that were in Israel that expanded that. Yeah. So um, they, so one of the big events is uh, what the um, Palestinians call the Nakba. Yeah. Um, and it was a, a, a pretty brief period where a bunch of paramilitary groups, uh, Jewish paramilitary groups were driving Palestinians out of their homes across, um, Israel and Palestine. Yeah. And, um, uh, and they ended up displacing probably more than a, three quarters of a million people, wow. um, over a period of a few days, I think, or, you know, maybe a month or something like that, yeah. um, driving them out and creating refugees out of them. And these people still don't have their own nation, by the way. Yeah. Um, now some of these people ended up in Gaza or the West Bank, Palestinian territories, but a lot of them ended up in like Syria and Jordan, yeah. um, as they were fleeing the, the violence. Um, and it was like very clearly coercive. Yeah. Um, and so the Palestinians talk about the right of return that, and this is what, this is a pretty much a constant march that's going on, yeah. um, by the Palestinians saying that they want to return to their ancestral homes yeah. that are, are occupied by Jewish peoples now. Yeah. And, um, and the, uh, Israeli defense forces like shoot kids over the fence and <laughs> so forth during yeah. these marches. Um, wow. so Anyway, we can probably try to avoid all of that and not get too. I mean, there's plenty. Down in the there's going to be yeah. There's yeah. going to be plenty of time to talk. I mean, there's going to be some big event again in the future where we can talk about that stuff a little bit more. Yeah. But the the basic pis history is that the UN gave away a bunch of territory that didn't belong to them um, to a bunch of people who didn't who didn't own that territory either, yeah. and they actually just kind of evicted. They were supposed to live with the people that were already there. And yeah. something that you've probably heard is uh, that Israel was um, a land without a people for the Jewish people without a land. Yeah. Um, but that's just a lie. There were millions <laughs> of Palestinians living in that territory. It wasn't yeah. an empty territory that was being given to them. It was a, it was a territory where people had been living for, um, families had been living for hundreds and thousands of years. Well, and the, a lot of that, a lot of this country, though, is is base is has religious value. Like there's there's land and stuff that has. Re oh yeah, I mean, well, that, and that's a big part of it is that the three major Western religions that are all kind of related to each other, um, yeah. Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, yeah. um, all have holy sites around Jerusalem in this area. Yeah. 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 Um, and so there's, so yeah. it's not to say that like that nobody valued this area prior to world war two. Yeah. Like, well, but the other thing is that when the UN established this, they established Jerusalem as an international city. It wasn't supposed to belong to anybody. Oh yeah. Um, now, really? <laughs> yeah. Um, now of course the, uh, the Israeli Jews, control Jerusalem except for little slivers of neighborhoods Pockets, like yeah. Sheikh Jarrah. Yeah. Um, and they are slowly kicking people out. And I yeah. say slowly, it's not really that slowly. Yeah. But um, East Jerusalem is the only thing that's still part of the Palestinian territories because it's it's the edge of the, the West Bank territory. Yeah. Um but they're you know they're they're carving up these neighborhoods uh, settling um, Israeli Jews. And I, I should just start saying Israelis because the truth is that in Israel um, there are different... You're only a citizen if you're a Jew. Yeah. Palestinians living in Israel yeah, are not I, citizens of Israel. They're second rate. Yeah. Yeah. I, w I won't even say citizens, just yeah. yeah, yeah. So, not um, recognized. As... So when I say Israelis, you can just assume that I'm that I'm talking about Jewish Israelis. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so the they they were given a little over half of this territory, um, of which uh, Jews actually had gone in and started. They, like the Zionist movement had already started, right? It started in the late 19th century, I think. Um, and there were already Jews that had moved into the ter the territory there, what they consider their ancestral territories, and started buying up land. But yeah. they only owned about like seven or eight percent of the land. Yeah. Um, and then they had this huge territory given to them. And then they immediately like so Israel has always been an expansionist power too. Yeah. Um, so they immediately 
uh, started pushing out into the territories around what they were given. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, the Nakba was the big movement where they, they kicked out, you know, somewhere between three quarters of a million and a million people yeah. um, that were living there. Um, and and I say kicked out, like they, they were... Uh, they were also killing these people. Like these yeah. people were they, fleeing. They were they were mo- re- removed by force. Yeah. Yeah. Um. And uh. And then they expanded into seventy eight percent, a little over three quarters of what had been the Palestinian territory. Yeah. Um. And then there. And that's what. Uh, the the Nakba is what triggered the Arab powers, um, to, to become more antagonistic with Israel. Yeah. But Israel actually started the 1967 war too, yeah. um, and that's where they they took um, the West Bank and Gaza, or uh, or I should say Gaza and the West Bank, including um, the East Jerusalem area. Uh, the The West Bank and East Jerusalem had been controlled by Jordan at that time, and the Gaza Strip had been controlled by Egypt. Um, they also took the Golan Heights from Syria. Um, now, international law says that you can't keep territory gained uh, in a war. It, it, the yeah. idea being that we don't want to give people an incentive to go to, to war go with start, each other. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but they've never given that territory back. Yeah. Uh, and of course, you know, one of the reasons that I had started, you know, putting this together a couple of years ago is because Trump was was Reckon- accepting. That they can that it was Israeli territory. I remember the Golan Heights thing was a big deal when Trump. Yeah. Yeah, accepted that as. Um, yeah, that Israel was yeah. the sovereign power. Recognizing there. it, yeah, I forget mm-hmm. the exact wording, but yeah, he recognized the Golan Heights as Israeli land or whatever. Yeah. So. Um, and that's in direct contravention to international law uh, under yeah. the UN. Yeah. The problem, of course, is that the UN's uh, enforcement arm. Is the United States military? Yeah. So, so, so when Trump kind of comes out and recognizes it, there's not really a whole lot that UN can do about that. I mean, yeah. they're, I mean, they can like speak against it, yeah. but that's really about all they can do. They don't really have a. They haven't really been doing anything about it anyway. Yeah. Well, but, I mean, yeah. I, yeah. I mean, I, I don't really know, but I imagine they're probably not even speaking out much against it. Yeah. Just. Um, I mean, so. A few points to make about this. Like, the question is, I mean, we, we can get into this, like, political question, but I think that the question is really a moral one. And it, the the question is, um, do, who has the greater right to the land? Yeah. Is it the, the Arab peoples who had been living on that land and working that land for generations or is it the European Jews who were granted that land by the European powers in the United States after World War II? Yeah. Um, and I think the, the question is an easy one to answer to me. Yeah. Um, it is, but at the same time, it, it's hard for me to come down really hard on either side because even I, I understand that a lot of this land was taken um, – immorally Mm -hmm. but at the same time a lot of these people have settled and spent their whole lives on this land yeah they have now i mean there's still people that were that were pushed out in 1948 that have been trying to get home all this time though too but it's it's still a difficult question because Mm -hmm. i mean you start to have to ask yourself all right like who well so the reason that it's such a difficult question, though, is because the Israeli government has decided that it will be an exclusively Jewish state. Yeah. Well, that's 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 the problem. Yeah. Uh, because the 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 only real way to solve this is for the government to allow the people to live together. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm gathering from our conversation here that the Israeli government just isn't willing to do that. No, no, definitely not. Um, and I saw, I did see some um, interviews of just people on the street um, during these like basically riot, riots yesterday. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of, a lot of the questions being asked, well, can, can, can the communities overcome this? Can the people living here, can you ever forgive your neighbors or anything like that? And overwhelming the answer was, was a reluctant no. Like, no, like this is like, we, we've come too far down this. And that may be just the heat of the moment, you know, I mean, mm-hmm. they're literally fighting with their neighbors, but, but it's, it's a bad situation. It's a sad situation. It doesn't seem like it here right now, but about, uh, about 20 years ago, I would have said that this country had overcome slavery. 
Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's true, and 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 it's it's not to say it can it can't be done, but it's it's not going to happen with the government intent on just pushing one group out. Yeah. And and the other group's never going to allow that to mm -hmm. to persist. I mean, they they yeah. they they want that land just as much as the Israelis do mm -hmm. because they have a religious tie to the land. Well, they have a family tie to the land. That well, that that's, too. That's the more important part, I think. Yeah. Um, now, and I can hear people saying in the, you know, in the peanut gallery now, um, yeah. well, but the, the people that, you know, the European Jews are the descendants of the Jewish people who had been there before. Yeah. And that's just not really true. There, there's a few yeah. things to say about that. Um, first off, uh, Judaism used to be a proselytizing religion. It found converts all over the world. And the, the like the idea of Jewish ethnicity is a farce. Um, there's, you know, different languages, customs, and so forth. Um, the religion is the only tie between these people. Yeah. And, and I would say actually like a lot of people that consider themselves Jewish, at least in the U S that a lot of people that I have known that consider themselves Jewish were not really religious either. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, but the, I mean, that's neither here nor there. Uh, and, and in actuality, the Palestinians, um, are descendants of the same, those same, uh, Israelite tribes that had settled that area. Yeah. Um, but they had converted to uh, Christianity or Islam over time. Yeah. And that's another important point that I, I don't think a lot of people in the U S know yeah. is that about 20% of the Palestinians are Christian. Yeah. Like it's not just those heathen Muslims. And I, I say that <laughs> Yeah. Tongue in cheek. But yeah. um, it's, you know, it's not just the those, you know, violent extremist Muslims like a, about one in five Palestinians is Christian yeah. um, and they're oppressed in the exact same way. Yeah. Uh, and it's because they're Arab. It's not because of their religion. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's just a, you know, it's just another extension of, of racism. And the ironic thing about it uh, is that, well, uh, you know, I guess we can talk about Zionism a little bit like. So, uh, you know, the history of Zionism, the idea that the, the, um, the land of Israel belongs to the Jews, that God gave them that land, yeah. um, and that it was the, uh, the right and even the, the duty of the Jewish people to return to that land, and that would bring about the end of, you know, the return of Jesus, or the return of God, and, you know, et cetera. I don't remember. Yeah. I, it's like the whole thing's kind of confusing to me. The Christian side of it thinks that that triggers the end of times. Yeah. Um, but it, at any rate, in the 1920s, the Orthodox Jews thought that God expelled the Jews from the Holy Land in the Babylonian exile, and it wasn't the place of any mortal to decide when they should return. <coughs> right? Yeah. Like that, it, it wasn't the, the place of the people to decide when you know, it should be, it should be God that's making that decision. Yeah. Um, and then the reformed Jews organized actually originally in opposition to the small Zionist movement of the 1920s uh, because they saw Zionism as a, as idolatrous, um, where, you know, blood and soil had replaced God, Torah and the prophets as the, as the thing to be honored. Uh. Right. Um, and, uh, and they rejected that they were part of a, uh, diaspora that they were that they had all um, moved out of that uh, out of that land, um, and they the and this is still the the um, reformed Jews by the way uh, they didn't believe in an in a racial or ethnic Judaism, um, and in fact at that time the only people that were really interested in Jewish blood so to speak were anti Semites, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. and you know now now the the Israeli position is that Jewish blood is important, right? Yeah. Um, always amazing how these things flip over time. Yeah. And the, you know, the other funny thing I talk about the, the racism inherent in all this. Um, the, the other funny thing is that the Christian Zionists, uh, after world war two, that, that helped set up the Israeli state and, um, and transport Jewish people over there, uh, in all likelihood, many of them, we're trying to remove the Jews from their local populations. Yeah. You know? like, <laughs> right. um, so that, you know, divert them to the middle East, yeah. uh, get them out of here. We don't want them in our neighborhood, you yeah. know? Um, so I don't know. The whole thing is, is kind of absurd, but as of today, um, the, 
the real question is a moral question about how the Palestinians are treated by the Israeli state. Um, yeah. I've already said that they are not citizens. They're not full citizens of the state. Um, there are these areas, uh, Gaza in particular, that are, are really tightly controlled. These people are living, uh, living under military occupation. Yeah. Um, it has been described over and over again as an open-air prison. The whole society is set up in an apartheid state. Um, just like South Africa was all that time ago, there is a there is a difference in what your rights are depending on whether you Who are you Arab are. or not. Yeah, yeah. Um, and um, well, you'll never have peace that way. I mean, that's I mean that's just the 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 reality. I mean, you're, you you can't, and it's the same way in this country. If we, because mm -hmm. we're already kind of going down that road a little bit, where some people get treated different than others, mm -hmm. you can't have peace that way. Yeah. Like every everybody has to be treated and and respected equally, and then you can have, mm -hmm. you can have a have a peaceful situation. But there's no way. Like I mean, if you're going to treat one group better than another, then you're destined to have problems. Yeah. And so that becomes the question: is like, are they dealing with all this violence? from the Palestinians yeah. the way they report it? Yeah. Is it because of the way they already treat the Palestinians? Yeah. I mean, would well, they would they would they have this fight on their hands if they treated them like everybody else? If yeah. they had full citizenship, if um, they didn't, you know, in in the Gaza Strip, they really tightly control what goes in and out of that territory. Yeah. And they intentionally keep the people on the edge of starvation. Yeah. Um and, uh, you know, like one of the more interesting little factoids that I came across, and I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if people can relate to this. I'm going to try and present it in a relatable way. But um, so the Israeli government controls the water supply that, that enters Gaza, um, and they limit it to like the total water supply to 80 liters per person per day. <laughs> um, the average American uses roughly 300 liters yeah. per person <laughs> I mean, I per day. I could imagine, yeah. yeah. Um, so these people are, are often having to choose, and, and this becomes a real serious health issue yeah. um, because yeah. people are having to choose whether they, uh, whether they cook their food or bathe themselves. Yeah, yeah. Um, and things like this. So, yeah. That's, um, yeah, and that's that can be a difficult decision because the like one of those is important all the time, yeah, and one of those is important enough of the time, <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know. Um, so you know, the question is whether you you continue to tolerate the way that the the Israeli government treats the Palestinian people as as a second class group, if yeah. that's acceptable. And the problem is that the um that the Israeli state has a very strong lobby in the U S and across Europe and, in every country that has any real influence. Yeah. Um, and, and not just at the federal level, but at the state level as well. Oh and, yeah. I don't, I just thought about it now that you mentioned that when you say state level, mm -hmm. um, governor Ivy came out in support, as said, are signed some kind of n n mean nothing thing, mm -hmm. saying that you know we we stand by the Israeli government. Yeah. Um. And that was she did that like yesterday. Yeah. So uh, you you live in a state that supports the Israeli government. Yeah. So for whatever that means, because when when they reported on it, I was like, well, this is like garbage. Like, wh who? Why does she have any? Like, she has no influence over this whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Well, the, Why even get the group that I know the most about is uh, is VIAB. It's the Vin Virginia Israeli Advisory Board. Oh. Um, and there's been a few interviews with uh, Grant Smith. Grant, I think it's Grant Smith, um, who wrote a book about this that Scott Horton has done over the last uh, few years. And it is fascinating and terrifying at the same time yeah. that the um, that the Israeli lobby has moved down to the state level and so they have a a government board that <laughs> helps decide who gets various licenses and so forth and they preferentially choose Israeli companies that's crazy at at the Virginia state level <laughs> yeah that's and that's... that and they're not the only one yeah, well, I bet not. Like, I mean, it, it was very odd to me when I saw that deal yesterday about mm -hmm. Ivy. Like, I was like, man, like, she, why, why are we involved? Why is she involved in this at all? Yeah. Like, <laughs> well, and I'm sure that she was, uh, you know, a big supporter of the people of Hong Kong. 
um, <laughs> who are far better treated by the People's Republic of China yeah. than the Palestinians are treated by the Israeli government. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh-huh. And and these are similar so, similar yeah. things. Yeah. Um, but you know we're on the one side of the one because we are opposed to everything China, and we're on the other side of the other because we're all on board with Israel. Yeah. Well, I, and, and we kind of discussed it here now, but like I did want to kind of ask you as we kind of wrap this conversation up, mm-hmm. like so solution wise, like what can be done? What kind of struck me at the beginning of this conversation is when when you were talking about the way that the states in in the Middle East were kind of divided intentionally mm-hmm. to kind of pit groups against one another. Yeah. And, and I know this is all pie in the sky, but could you ever see maybe a situation where you redraw some of those lines and start to, to put the right people into the right type of areas to create peace? Yeah, well, um, you know, I'm a big believer in secession. Yeah. Uh, the problem is that governments don't want to give up their control. Yeah. Uh, so, well, I mean, if we allowed, and I don't think the U.S. would allow it. Well, yeah. The, and, you know, and a big part of this, I think, before we kind of before you dive too far in, is mm-hmm. like I, I think a big part of the solution here is for the U.S. to just get out of mm-hmm. it. Like I don't, yeah. I don't think we need to be mediating all of this. I think that if, mm-hmm. if we let these parties, I mean, they may go to war for a little while. And that may be the best way. That may be the best way to redraw the lines, though, mm-hmm. is to. And, and I, I hate to advocate for war, and I don't really want to advocate for war. But that might be what it takes to get those lines redrawn in a way where peace can can happen. Yeah. Well, I mean, we're we're kind of seeing it in Afghanistan. Yeah. Um. You know, most of the people of Afghanistan don't consider themselves, you know, Afghani people. They consider themselves whatever tribe yeah, they're a part they're of. They're tribal. Yeah. Um. It's only like a small area, probably around Kabul, that even thinks of themselves as Afghanis. Yeah. Um. But we've created this this huge territory that, and given the impression that a single government can control it all, and so everybody wants to. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and that's the problem that you run into. Uh, in terms of the Israel-Palestine conflict specifically, they had worked out a deal called the Oslo Accords that where they would just go back to the 67 borders where um, where the Israeli state controlled 78% of that territory yeah. and the Palestinians got the other 22%. Um, and, uh, and it was a two-state solution that they were supposed to be working towards, but the the Israeli government has completely ignored it. Yeah. Um, so they made an agreement and then they just didn't honor <laughs> didn't, it. Didn't follow through with it. Yeah. yeah. Um, at this point, uh, <laughs> I don't know. I'm kind of, I don't know that I have the answer, but um, I think at this point, the, the thing to do um, would be to just grant Palestinians full citizenship. Yeah. Um, if, if a people feel like they have an influence on the government that controls them, they're less likely to fight against it, yeah. especially if they feel like they can become a part of it. We're case in point there. Oh, like yeah. the government's constantly working against us, but most people in this country don't work against the government because they well, think that, you plenty, know, well, plenty of people would die to defend that government. Well, that's true. I mean, I, in, in some yeah. sense I would, well, in some sense I would too, <laughs> but at the same time, like it's is an oppressive government. Like yeah. I mean, we live under oppressive government, but when you talk to people, they don't really view it that way. Yeah, because of democracy and because of the idea that you could be a part of that government. Yeah. That the average person like could be a part of that government. Now the truth yeah. of that I don't think is is <laughs> is based in reality. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um but you know, the people are less likely to fight against uh, an organization that they feel that they are a part of. Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. And I think I think you're right. That's kind of the direction I was thinking, at least as far as Israel's concerned, mm-hmm. yeah. is, is if you, you know, if you give these people equal rights across the board and then kind of let the chips start falling where they may, but there's no incentive for Israel to do that. Yeah, it would have to... It would take international pressure. Yeah. Um, now, I think that a good movement, and we've talked about the the boycott, divest, and sanction movement here before. Yeah. Um, I think that that's actually a good. I mean, that's how that's how uh, the international community pressured South Africa to end apartheid. Yeah. Um, and I think that that would that that can be effective here, and I think it shows how effective it could be because they've worked so hard. To, to lobby for legislation it. Yeah. against it. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. 
So, you know, that's, that's certainly a part of it, but I, I don't know. I, I mean, I guess the Israeli people feel just threatened enough to be opposed to the Palestinians, but not threatened enough to make any change Yeah, that might make them less aggressive. Yeah. Well, and I, I, you know, again, I make that sound like the Palestinians are the, the problem and I don't think that they are. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think that they are, that they are reacting in a very natural way to a real strong oppressive government. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that they're, I, I would say that they're just rebelling against a, an oppressive government and I'm yeah. totally on board with that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, I, so I don't know. I, I think that unfortunately I, you know, and I hate to advocate for organizations like the UN, but I, I think yeah. that, um, pressure from the UN, um, you know, international pressure from, uh, governments, uh, around the world and, um, economic pressure from people. Yeah. could cause the the uh, Israeli government to rethink their strategy. Yeah, yeah. And that's that. That's a good point. It, it is strategy. This is a strategy that mm-hmm. they're running right now. Yeah. And um, and and I think from from their perspective, there it's it's a good one. Like, yeah. Because well, but if you if you back off of it and you look at it for what it really is, it is a yeah. strategy of ethnic cleansing. Oh yeah, absolutely. I have no <laughs> question. Like I I don't I, I'm. I wholeheartedly agree, yeah. but like I say, I don't know. I was. It's an interesting conversation. I'm sure this is something we'll discuss in more in depth. Yeah. Now that we've crossed the line, may as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> may as well keep going. Yeah. Uh, now that we've uh, set ourselves out, out as uh, clear and obvious anti-Semites, <laughs> um, yeah. we may as well just stick with it. Yeah. And and maybe we can finally get on the SPLCs list of anti-government extremists. Maybe this will help. One day. Yeah. Um, I, I do want to be on that list, not on the white supremacist group list or whatever the other yeah. thing is, but, you know. Yeah. Um, so we actually spent a lot of time talking about that. Uh, well, I knew we would. When I kind of yeah. read your, your notes earlier, I was like, yeah, this is we're going we're gonna to get in depth here tonight. Yeah. <laughs> Which yeah. is good. I mean, I think it's, it's a good thing. Like I say, I'm not very educated on this, so this is mm-hmm. all interesting to me. Yeah. So. Well, good. I hope it's interesting to the listeners out there, too. Um, the other thing that we wanted to talk about, uh, although I'm not sure that we have time because I do – want to talk a little bit about the vaccine thing again. Okay. Um, but maybe we can just spend a little bit of time talking about this pipeline issue. Oh yeah. Um, cause we, we were, t- you know, we said that we needed to take some time to talk about what prices do and yeah. are and so forth. That was originally and, what we talked about the other day is a topic for this podcast. I yeah. For- I completely forgot about that. And so, um, the, the pipeline, uh, being shut down is a, is a good reason to talk about that. I mean, we could, yeah. You know, we can talk about gouging again, but yeah. um, but a better way to approach it, I think, is to just talk about prices. Now, we will probably see uh, a significant rise in gas prices. I and, already like, have. Well, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, now, this pipeline was shut down after Harvey uh, as well. Was it? Um, yeah. yeah, and we saw a 50, 60 cent per sure. gallon rise. Yeah. Um, I suspect that we'll see that again. Now... I, I the just pipeline to, is back up and operational now. By the way, right? I think I, I, I think I'm right about that. I'm not sure. I, I want to say I heard yesterday that that they had it back. Or no, it's not fully operational, I guess. But it's mm-hmm. supposed to be close. Okay, maybe. See, they they created a panic. Yeah. Um, which is the issue? Like that's that's. That's where all of this kind of stems from. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, if you hadn't told anybody that this pipeline was out and just let things kind of run its course, it may not would have seen much of an effect at all. Yeah. But, like, you announce that there's, oh, no, there's a pipeline out. Guess mm-hmm. what, everybody? And then everybody fills in the blank from there. Like, oh, yeah. it's time to go buy all the gas. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. time to start filling up con- plastic containers and mm-hmm. styrofoam coolers of gas. That doesn't work, by the way. <laughs> oh, I know it don't work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but It just it, burns right through. Yeah. It uh, ain't stop people from doing it, though. It melts styrofoam. I saw on the news <laughs> last night somebody, I don't know what kind of container they used, but they had a, a um, oh, what was it? <laughs> just the, so everyone knows there's a particular kind of plastic that you have to use to store gasoline. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Somebody had a big, it was a Jeep or something that caught on fire at a gas station because they were filling up containers that couldn't hold the gas. I don't know that they were styrofoam, but there was something and it burned the SUV to the ground. Uh, 
So, uh, rednecks in South Georgia used to drink uh, whiskey and gasoline out of styrofoam cups, and the goal was to drink it before it ate through the styrofoam <laughs> cup. Good night, man. <laughs> Oof. Talk about your bad ideas. Yeah, no kidding. I, those guys were nuts. Yeah, um, clearly. <laughs> anyway, but you know what prices do is signal to the market what um, where there's a need. What does well? It, it's a, it signals the supply. Because if the, in many ways, because mm-hmm. if there's an oversupply of something, then the price will drop right. and, and alleviate that. In the same way, if there's not enough, like if there's not enough, the prices need to increase. So, which is what's going on with ammo right now. Well, but it's, so here's the thing. It's not just supply though. This It's supply and demand for a reason because both things are necessary. Yeah. Right. Um, you can have the uh, a warehouse full of, or you can just have uh, only just one crate of um, little plastic doggy doos. Yeah. But if nobody wants them, it doesn't matter. Well, that's true. <laughs> you know? Well, that's true. There uh, has to be. So there, there has to be a demand for the product. Well, yeah, but, but we're t- speaking in terms of like obviously there's a clear mm-hmm. demand for gas. Yes. So. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah. At least right now, I mean, Biden would would, would disagree that we're we're going electric, right? Yeah. Well, I heard somebody. Where do you think the electricity comes from? They burn <laughs> fossil fuels for electricity too. Exactly. Just, like the big power plants unless you're going nuclear yeah which i'm on board with yeah um but other than that this actually you know what we probably should have done is taken this opportunity instead of talking about prices we should probably should have talked about climate change yeah (laughs) go ahead and like as long as we're going to be on the third rail for an episode we just (laughs) Just, just just like go all in yeah um but uh no, no, no so prices a price is a signal um to uh suppliers about what they need to do yeah. Um, and potential suppliers. Yeah. Uh, so if the demand is high enough, if, if demand outstrips supply to a point that price continues to climb, it incentivizes other people to enter that market yeah. and to provide that same service or product. Yeah, um, absolutely. And and the other way works too. So if the demand, if supply greatly outstrips demand, um, and the prices are depressed because of that, then it incentivizes people to leave that market. Um, and go apply their uh, their labor in a place that's more productive for the whole. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Got to go where the money's at. Yeah. Um, so, the, you know, this is the... And so one of the things that comes up a lot is that, uh, that profit is bad. You know, the profit motive is bad. We and, discussed that on the last podcast. Yeah, well, and that was supposed to be the point of this, right? Like yeah, gonna, yeah. Um, and so the... But it's the profit motive that ensures that you get the products that you want. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and wh- while there's such a bad name around profit, what profit really means is like profit is really in in a true free market. Yeah. Without the interference of government, um, what profit really means is that uh, you can only generate profit by enriching others. Yeah. Because there's a, a difference. There's a disparity disparity in value judgments, and that's an important part. Of, of any market because if everybody agreed on what the value of something was then there would be no no real incentive for exchange um, beyond just a one for one swap on very very regular things like you know yeah. like a like a real basic barter yeah. um, but because there's a, a disparity in value judgments um, then first off that moves the the price to an acceptable level where um, the greatest number of people are satisfied on both the supply side and the demand side. Yeah. Right. Um, But the other thing is that uh, in order to generate profit, what you have to do is you have to offer a product to people that they want and that they want more than whatever they're giving to you for it. Yeah, exactly. Right. So um, from any consumer's perspective uh, in a true free market, um, they have given something of lesser value for something of greater value. And the same is true for the supplier yeah. because they want your money more than the product and you want their product more than the money. Yeah. Um, so everybody has become richer in their, in their own personal sense uh, yeah. from all of these sales. So, well, so profit can, is driven by actually enriching everybody else. Yeah. 
And you can talk about how corporations are evil and they're bad and whatnot. But the truth of the matter is, is in a true free market, nobody forces you to do business with anybody else. Right. You choose to do it. And if you think that this company is bad or evil, mm -hmm. like Pfizer, and um, <laughs> then, then yeah, I mean, you don't do business with them. You do business with somebody who you think is a good company. Right. You know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, unfortunately, we're in a situation where there's a whole bunch of products that you were forced to buy by the government. Well, yeah, and that that's like insurance. The, the government is 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 kind of the X factor here. Like mm -hmm. that that's kind of what creates the situation where you end up with evil monopolistic corporations. Yeah, um, you wouldn't have that if you didn't have the government involved. Yeah. Uh, yeah, in a true free market, um, a business can only maintain a monopoly by providing the best product at the best price. Yeah, all the time. Yeah, a and at every level because yeah. every product has different levels of, of desire. Like, yeah. uh, you know, shoes, um, you can't be a monopolist on shoes unless you're providing the best sneakers, the best dress shoes, the best, you know, casual browns, the best flip-flops, the best everything. Crocs. And at every price level, yeah, because yeah. people have a, a you know desire for a different level of fanciness. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so now there are, of course, regional monopolies. We we saw a lot of them in cable uh, a long time ago, where there was only one provider and and so forth. But that changes. Yeah. It, that changed over time, and as the technology changed, that changed. Um, oh yeah. You, you know you you saw the. Um, the uh, entry of uh, satellite links uh, to compete with cable companies. And, you know, I yeah. mean, so it, it, the market doesn't always adjust as quickly as we would like, but it adjusts in the best way over time. Yeah. Um, and the government interference creates these perturbations in the market that you, they just never know the long-term effects. And it usually creates more problems than it solves. Exactly. Um, so speaking of Pfizer, <laughs> I guess, <laughs> Since, uh, yeah. nice little segue there. <laughs> um, so I, I've had some, uh, some interactions with some people about, uh, about some of the things that I was saying about the vaccines and I feel like I need to clarify some stuff and I may have misstated or, uh, led people to believe, um, something that's not completely, uh, accurate, um, about the VAERS data, uh, about the, um, uh, the reporting system data, yeah. um, the, uh, vaccine adverse event reporting system, which is where we're getting these death numbers and hospitalization numbers and so forth associated with the vaccines. It, it doesn't necessitate a causal relationship. Okay. Okay. So, um, if I said that, uh, a certain number of deaths were caused by vaccines, um, that was probably not the right word to use. Yeah. Um, associated is maybe a better word. Yeah. Uh, but you know, back to what we were talking about last week, we'll never be able to establish a causal relationship because they eliminated the control group. Exactly. Right? But there is a reason that those, um, that reporting system exists. And there is a reason that the, uh, that the medical facility reported, um, these deaths as related to, um, the vaccine. Yeah. yeah. So, um, well, and I would, I, I would venture to guess, and I don't know, just from the little bit I've seen of people getting vaccines and whatnot, that the information there's probably underreported because uh, maybe not as far as deaths, maybe, mm -hmm. maybe not, but I would definitely think as far as like adverse effects, because I mean, people I know that's taken the vaccine and had not mm -hmm. like death or anything, but have gotten sick and had issues. It's not like they went back to the doctor and it got reported to anybody. Yeah. They just kind of sucked it up and dealt with it. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's like I say, I mean, it's not perfect, but I'm just saying like I would my I would venture to say that at least adverse side effects um, are probably underreported to there. Well, I, I've actually heard commentary that somewhere between um, one in 10% of, uh, adverse events are actually reported to the system. Yeah. I, I mean, I would, I would venture to believe that. Mm -hmm. So, um, but the, uh, y you know, you're not here on the other side of this. And so I have a couple of clips from, um, this Dr. McCullough, uh, Peter McCullough, I think I should have written that down. <laughs> um, 
Anyway, uh, he is a, or was, a, um, a very well-respected cardiologist, like top of his field in cardiology. He's the, uh, the head of the Baylor um, School of Medicine, et cetera, has been published a lot. Yeah. Um, and, uh, He's no slouch. Yeah, definitely no slouch. Very well-respected in his field, and he, um, you know, by all accounts, is a, is a very good physician. Yeah. Um, but he was on the wrong side of things at the beginning of this, and he was advocating for treatments to mitigate the effects of the virus, um, including hydroxychloroquine and, um, you know, uh, some other antivirals and, and yeah. so forth, and, and had been very critical of the fact that, that people with the virus were being told to just go home for two weeks, um, and they weren't being treated in any way. Yeah. Um, let me also add here that you can't get emergency use authorization for a vaccine if there are viable treatments. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so that could be a reason that some of these things were um, were ignored. Ivermectin, hydroxychloroquine. Wow, I didn't know that. That never really occurred to me. Um, yeah, well... It <laughs> just makes my uh, conspiracy mind go even further. I know, and just saying that is going to definitely get this podcast kicked <laughs> off of YouTube, but yeah. um, I didn't say that they were effective treatments. I'm just I'm saying that it's at least I'm an open saying, question. It, it seemed to be, during the height of all of this, that, that there... It, there nobody, is evidence to suggest that they are effective treatments. Well, exactly, and it, there seemed to be a very vicious campaign to undermine that. Yes, um, and it's just my memory of it, but mm -hmm. I mean, well, on that note, uh, Dr. McCullough has some comments about, um, the trusted news system. Yeah. And so let's go ahead and, uh, and play that clip. All right. Uh, there is a trusted news initiative, which is very important for Americans to understand. This was announced December 10th, and this is a coalition of all the major media and government stakeholders in vaccination where they are not going to allow any negative information on vaccines to get into the popular media uh, because they're concerned about vaccine hesitancy. That if Americans got any type of fair balance on safety events, that they simply wouldn't come forward voluntarily and get the vaccine. So the Trusted News Initiative is really troublesome because uh, we're now at record numbers of deaths. They continue to occur every day. Okay. Um, so yeah, this is something that should be obvious to anybody who's reading, uh, science materials that, that the major media sources are going out of their way to cover up any kind of negative, um, stories about the vaccines. Um, and so yeah. I just want to use this to, to talk about our position here. Yeah. Um, and the reason that, that we're, that we're doing the reporting that we're doing um, we are not anti-vaxxers, either one of us. Yeah, no, by um, no means. And But what we do believe in is informed consent. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, and so that's why we're presenting all of this info, because the, the mainstream media is not giving you a full picture. No, and, and it's painfully obvious to anybody that's paying any kind of attention mm -hmm. that that is you're not getting the full picture. And... And it just, for whatever reason, I mean, I, I, I would venture to say, given them the benefit of the doubt, that they just want as many people to get this thing as, they, as, as will, and that they think this is the best way to go about that. Well, uh, maybe, maybe not. I got, I, mean, another, may, yeah. I got another clip from Dr. McCullough that may make you question that part of it, too. Fair enough. Let's All hear right. it. All right. A lot of Americans don't understand how tight these stakeholders are. Keep in mind, the National Institutes of Health is a co-owner of the Moderna patent. So they have a vested financial interest in keeping these vaccines going. So the United States government has made a decision along with the stakeholders, CDC, NIH, FDA, Big Pharma, World Health Organization, Gates Foundation. They have made a commitment to mass vaccination as a solution to the COVID-19 pandemic. And we are going to uh, really be witness to what's going to happen in history. We're sitting on right now uh, the biggest number of vaccine deaths. There's been tens of thousands of hospitalizations, all attributable to the vaccine and going strong. Okay. So, yeah, here he's talking about stakeholders. And this is something that we 
that we talk about with some frequency. And this is something that the left in particular talked about quite a bit right up until this event. <laughs> right. And, uh, you know, we mentioned it last week. Like, this is big pharma. Oh, absolutely. Like, <laughs> make no mistake. And and the government has a vested interest here. Yes. Like, they, they threw a whole bunch of our money mm-hmm. at this thing. And Fauci specifically has a vested interest in this, too. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so just everybody, like, money interests rule the day. And, uh, and the National Institute of Health that has a... Um, a uh, an economic interest in seeing this vaccine do well yeah. um, is a government agency, <laughs> right? <laughs> All of these kind of work hand in hand. Yeah. Like, so you know, we're not telling you don't go get the vaccine. We're just saying, yeah. like, do your research. Know that there is a risk associated with this. Yeah. Um, if you feel that this is the best option for you, then great. Yeah. Go do it. Nobody's nobody's stopping you. That's for sure. Yeah. But. Um, the, I think a point that is that we're losing a lot because we get so bogged down in this stuff is that the position that we're really taking here is that everybody gets to choose their own path here. Yeah. And so we are absolutely opposed to any kind of mandatory vaccinations. Oh, absolutely. Um, and that, that seems to be the direction that we're moving in. And we we're talking about discrimination based on, uh, various factors earlier in this podcast yeah. and, um, vaccination status is one of them. And I don't feel like it is anybody's business to ask me whether I've been vaccinated or not. I've had this conversation with multiple people just today, given what the CDC announced yesterday and, and that's the, the thing that I keep pushing and reminding everybody that I talk to is that this is protected information. This is yeah. medical information. And nobody, including your employer, has a right to ask you those type of questions. Mm-hmm. Um, and just so, I mean, I'm sure most everybody's heard, but maybe not, because I talked to a lot of people today that hadn't heard this, that the CDC announced yesterday that they're no longer recommending masks for people who's been vaccinated in basically any type of environment. They said they still want people to wear them on planes and buses and stuff, Mm -hmm. but that's it. Like buildings, like all of that, like that, that recommendation is gone for people who's been vaccinated. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of where the conversation has been is like, okay, well, how do you kind of determine that? And my understanding is, is we're going on the honor system here, like yeah. that, that vaccine passports and all this. We're not doing all that. Like, mm-hmm. and there's, and that to me, that makes sense. Like, because a vaccinated person should have nothing to fear from an unvaccinated person. Right. I, I mean, there's If no, you believe in the vaccine, yeah. then what does it matter well, to you? Well, and they, and they're, they're claiming hardcore, especially the reason they made these recommendations yesterday is because they're saying this vaccine is effective. Mm-hmm. Like it, that it absolutely is. And, and, and I'm, I don't necessarily disagree with them. I think yeah. they're probably right. I believe that it is effective. I believe it is effective. I believe that we don't know what the long-term effects are, though. Yeah, because that's my, just that's my concern. Yeah, it just that's, hasn't been I here. mean, that's the reason I won't be getting it. And, you know, and it's not that I, I have real strong doubts about the technology either. Like, one of my big charities is, um, is a gene therapy research uh, charity. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm not opposed to like fiddling around with the, with (laughs) With, your genetic code a little bit, um, to, to help solve problems. But my concern is, uh, and you know, I was talking to a friend of mine recently, old friend of mine, and he was, he was saying, well, you know, they're about to get that full authorization. Yeah. And I think that that, um, I think that that is irresponsible. Yeah. Uh, because generally vaccines go through years of testing. Yeah. Um, and even if we're going to test it on the population at large, yeah. we still should probably do it under an emergency thing and not under full authorization. Right. Exactly. Because, because that's what we're doing at this point. Like yeah, make no mistake true. about it. Like we're, this thing is being tested on the population at large and mm-hmm. time will tell how this plays out. Yeah. I mean, and I hope it, believe me, I hope that it plays out just fine. Mm-hmm. Like I don't want to see a swath of the population have severe effects from this thing. Yeah. Um, when they're exposed to the wild virus again next year or something or something like, yeah, yeah. that's, that's really the big fear. Yeah. Um, but, um, because that has been the historical problem with MRNA vaccines against coronavirus types. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, we'll see. I, I, yeah. And like I said, it's not that I don't believe in the technology and I think that it probably is a very effective vaccine. Um, but I'm not an early adopter of really much of anything yeah. and I don't intend to be to this. Yeah. And, um, and 
you want to fight on your hands, you tell me I have to get it. Yeah. You start trying to do mandatory vaccines and, and we've well, got a real I'll problem. I'll tell you where my fight and where I was really pushing the people that I spoke with today is with the employers. Like mm-hmm. I, I, I am not okay with my employer ask because that's what I'm worried about with the way this stuff was worded with the CDC yeah. is the company I work for and other companies too coming out and being like, all right, well, if you've got the vaccine, you don't have to wear a mask anymore. Mm-hmm. And to me, that just means I don't have to wear the mask anymore because it's not their business whether I got the vaccine or not. Yeah. Like they're, that's just, I'm, <clears throat> I'm not okay with releasing that information to them. Yeah. Formally. Yeah. Yeah. It's not their business. It's not. My, my medical information is between my doctor and myself. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, All of it. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. So that's that's where I'm at. And and I'm I, I hope that there's not a fight to be had here. I was really relieved yesterday when I saw these new C D C guidances because mm-hmm. I felt like, well, we're done. Like we're we're done here. Yeah. Like this this is pretty well over. Um the way and the way even the Biden administration came out with like we're gonna use the honor system here. Mm-hmm. Like, okay, like we're 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 officially going back to normal. Yeah. Um so we'll see. Yeah. I mean, time will tell. Like, I, I'm, I don't have my hopes up, but but I it did it. I did feel a lot better after hearing mm-hmm. that. That maybe we're on the right track here. Yeah. Well, I hope you're right. Um. So, ready to wrap? Yeah, I think I think we pretty well covered it, man. It's been a fun one. Okay. <laughs> um, technical issues and all. Hopefully, you guys won't notice. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, so I'm gonna go on and say it here because I was kind of trying to signal to you. Like, I do think like you kind of repeated some of the same things back over again because we did you may not have noticed that listeners but we had the 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 things the the machine shut cut up. out <laughs> shut up so nothing went wrong everything's fine yeah everything is fine <laughs> what am i talking about what do i know <laughs> feeling fine um okay so uh we plan to be back in a week Absolutely. Um, and uh we will uh we hope that you will like and share and subscribe and follow and comment and so on. What Absolutely. am I missing? Uh, iTunes, Podbean, YouTube is where you can find us. And, of course, our website at thelibertymike.com. As long as they leave this one up on YouTube, it'll be there. Yeah. Well, it took <laughs> them a little while to find the last one. And I, I am very cleverly not mentioning vaccines at all in my descriptions. So <laughs> they'll have to actually listen to They're it. They're going to have to dig it out of there. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Um, and uh, so, yeah, uh, we plan to be back in a week when we finally get this right. And in the meantime, try to stay free. Life short, live free. Ciao. Later. <laughs>